Is it possible that commonly used substances like caffeine or nicotine could actually be more harmful than we realize? What I see in my practice is that sometimes these seemingly harmless chemicals are often overlooked as causes in psychiatric illness. Today we're going to explore how these drugs, innocuous as they may seem, may sometimes cause problems with sleep and anxiety, sometimes to the extent that they could be gateway drugs onto psychiatric medications. Stay tuned to learn how this happens. In the psychiatric drug withdrawal community, we call people who haven't had drug injury from psych meds normal people or the normies, you know? So Mm -hmm. as a normie, you've taken these substances yourself, um, caffeine and nicotine. And I'm just curious, kind of in hindsight, obviously, which is always 2020, how they affected you and what you think about them, you know, now doing the work that you do as a psychiatrist who sees problems with other other drugs. Yeah. So hindsight's really interesting. I actually think that um, I, you know, my nicotine and and caffeine use led to me taking Xanax. Like, yeah, I, I never had a drug injury, but I was on Xanax for about five months. Um, it was right after my daughter was born. I just left residency. Um, I was working at the FDA at the time and I was um, totally overwhelmed. You know, I was used to being a clinician and then all of a sudden I was having to learn how to read all the clinical trials and it was a completely new job. We were struggling as a family. My wife was isolated. We'd moved across the country. Things were hard. And because I was so stressed about performance at work, um, I had really upped my caffeine and my nicotine use. And and to kind of just roll back, just to talk about where this started, this probably started when I was 16, at least with um, occasional cigarettes and then also with um, coffee use. Um, I didn't really smoke that consistently since then, kind of on and off. But it was only probably towards um, when I was like 25 and then onwards that, you know, I was using more actually chewing tobacco, which is like, because, you know, I have, I have asthma and I didn't want to like mess up my lungs. It's so stupid. So um, I came to the US and it was like a novelty for me because we don't have dip in Australia. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And anyway, so pretty quickly got, got hooked on that. And um, so did my wife, actually, which is probably really funny because you've seen her and she's very pretty and dainty and people mm-hmm. probably and she's over there know. got like a dip <laughs> in her lip. That's funny. <laughs> That's completely, <laughs> completely my influence on her. Um, so coffee use the, the whole time through, probably just a cup of coffee in the morning mostly, and then dip use probably for like the five years before I got to the FDA. And, and anyway, so after my daughter's born, um, I'm really struggling to learn all this new stuff. And so the coffee use goes from one in the morning to having a big cup in the morning, having one at around two o'clock and then like sneaking in like a diet Coke somewhere as well. So, and, um, you know, a caffeinated soda. And then at that time I was on Zen pouches and instead of the chewing tobacco, because it was, (laughs) I guess a little cleaner to have, have the Zen pouches in. And, um, you know, I went from, you know, maybe one or two a day to like, I could have like five of them throughout the course of a day, you know, just because I was just on this treadmill of trying to pump out as many, um, you know, reports as possible. It's incredible. Like the FDA is just report writing. It's all you do. So that's, you just like writing all day, which is really, I found that really taxing for me to have that rather than talking to people. So, um, what do I remember about my time then? Well, I remembered that my sleep was awful, um, that I would sometimes go to sleep. And then I thought this was normal for a long time. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would just be up. Like there was, there would be nothing I could do to go back to sleep again. It was just, and I knew it in my gut. It's almost like I could feel there was this switch in there, like this like burst of adrenaline or cortisol or something. And it's just like, Oh, you're up, you know? And then I would just sit there for hours and I wouldn't be able to go back to sleep. And even if that happened at uh, one o'clock in the morning, um, the other thing I remember about that time was that I could only really work well for about three 
three to four hours in the morning after I had my coffee and everything else for the rest of the day was just like a grind and a struggle. Um, and so I had to do everything at that time. And then the other thing I remembered about that time was that I also became quite lethargic for the rest of the day. Like I would, you know, after that period of time, like I would try to work, but a lot of times I would just find myself just kind of collapsed on the couch, just like, you know, scrolling on social media, um, wasting my time, not feeling a lot of motivation, having a hard time exercising. Um, I also remembered feeling more irritable during that period of time. Like I used to, I, I mean, this is awful to say, I used to resent having to read to my daughter at night. Um, and she's like one or two. And I'm at, at this time, I'm like, just like, oh, like, cause I'm so irritable. Like I'm crashing from like a lot of like stimulants at that time. And, um, obviously that's not great, not great for a relationship either. But that was like the context from which my, my Xanax use kind of started as well, because I started getting stressed about not being able to perform at work. And when I wouldn't sleep, I started getting worried about that. I'd wake up with this pit in my stomach and say, oh my God, like I cannot go to bed now and I need to wake up and I need to crank out this report on this deadline. And so, um, started using Xanax and, um, you know, as needed. <laughs> and clearly, I mean, everyone knows how this story goes, you know, within a couple of months, I'm taking it like every night. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, things are just kind of getting worse, you know, more irritability, more mood swings. Um, and I'm quickly becoming dependent on it. And, and so then, I mean, the symptom that really kind of set me off where I was just like, you know what, this is like, really needs to stop. I started getting these like obsessive thoughts, um, kind of the most shameful and embarrassing things that, you know, I had ever done in my life, you know, things that I would love to just leave in the past stuck in my head, repeating when I'm sitting there trying to focus on things. I'm just like, I've never had OCD. Like what the hell is going on with this? Mm -hmm. And, um, and by this time, you know, I knew, you know, I already knew long-term benzodiazepineus was bad, but you know, there I was anyway. And I'm just like, you know what, this is heading in a really bad direction. So I, so I came off and yeah, I am a normie because I came off easily actually. Um, and I didn't have any problems and I felt better. And then shortly thereafter, I, I came off the caffeine and the nicotine. But the first thing I wanted to say was, when the use spiraled out of control, like it was like a gateway drug for me into psychiatric medications mm -hmm. in a way. Oh, not to mention during that time, I would also routinely have like maybe two to three like uh, drinks at night, like alcoholic drinks at night when I'm coming off the stimulant. So it also massively drove um, kind of daily drinking. Um, and yeah, it would be easy to have like you know, two to three white claws a night. And obviously this is a really unhealthy lifestyle, but I don't actually think it's that uncommon, you know, just based on, you know, other people that I know, especially some of my patients that work in finance and things like that, where that's kind of a normal culture, but it's, it's not healthy. Um, and so here's what I noticed coming off this. So I, I come off this annex and I just go, you know what? I think I'm going to come off everything. And I cold turkeyed myself off, uh, off essentially nicotine and caffeine. Just, I just stopped. And honestly, for about two months, I was a total potato. Like I couldn't do anything. Thank God. I was like not really running my own business too much at that time. And I could kind of coast because I, um, I did not do much, uh, probably like the bare minimum at the time to kind of just survive. And it was really interesting because there was this really deep sense of peace and calm within me as I was not doing my work, which was really interesting. Like I felt really calm coming off of it, but really lacking motivation and being uninterested in things. And I watched a lot of Netflix. My anxiety just bottomed out. Like I had no anxiety anymore. It just went whoosh, like, mm -hmm. and slowly two months later afterwards, everything changed for me. 
I started sleeping like a teenager, you know, like I slept better than I had slept since I was 16 before all of this had started, like through the night, getting to bed easily, falling asleep again in the middle of the night. So that completely normalized for me. My mood became much more stable. I was less, way less reactive with my wife. You know, I kind of have a short fuse sometimes and get into stupid arguments. I would have much more space to think about what I'm, what I was going to say. And that that got better when I, I could work much longer. I could, the, here's the only difference about it. It takes me longer to get started in the morning. It takes me at least like 30 to 40 minutes to, to get going when I wake up before I would drink coffee and I'm like, good to go. I could do the hardest thing, yeah. but now I could work throughout the entire day. So I could be pretty productive for like, you know, six hours, obviously with little breaks here and then. And then if I needed to kind of come back on later on in the day, I could do it and, and it, it, it would be okay. So concentration became a lot more sustainable and, um, um, I actually became more efficient at work because I remembered that I almost became like a perfectionist and kind of obsessive about things. And I would get stuck on little details of the presentations after coming off all of that. I was just like, better able to identify what people cared about and less caught up in, 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 in things that actually didn't matter. So I became a lot more, I guess, less freaked out about things and more efficient. And I, and I never looked back, but the thing about it was, yeah, anyway, I'm going to stop there, but that, that's the story. That's, that's what happened to me. Yeah. I'm curious hearing that though. Um, I mean, obviously same for me, like my use of those substances started when I was a kid. And when you're a kid, you're just dumb and naive and you're not thinking that deeply about consequences or whatever. You're just making choices kind of based on what everybody else is doing probably. So I doubt at the time when you started using the substances that you were really kind of clued into why you were using them, but it sounds like more when you were working and you wanted to be efficient I'm just wondering if you had a conscious, like you were using them intentionally to focus more, like you knew physiologically what they were doing to you. And also your training as a psychiatrist, like did that kind of clue you in on like, oh, these drugs will help me do this and this, or it wasn't, it wasn't that deep. Yeah. Let me, let me touch on all of the points that you made, you know, step by step. Yeah. I started drinking coffee because of coffee culture, really. It's not like, it was just like, oh yeah, you go and like hang out with your friends at a coffee shop and like, that's, oh, that's where you go on a date. You're at a coffee shop and, and you do it. Maybe a little during my final year of school, I was using coffee more than just to kind of study and things like that. And that was normal. I mean, I had two older sisters. I was used to people drinking coffee. My dad's drinks coffee. My mom drinks coffee as well. So it's in the family and it was also in, I guess, normal Australian culture as I think it is in most places in the world. Mm -hmm. But when I got to the, you know, when I, um, you know, uh, I guess nicotine use was kind of, kind of mainly like a party thing, uh, for much of my twenties. And then when work started getting really serious for me after I finished residency and was in the, uh, FDA and industry. That's when it was like, Oh man, you like really have to start performing now. You know, you need to, you know, you've got a lot of responsibilities, a family, you want to get promotions and, th and things like that. And, and so at that point, yeah, it was performance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. So you were aware of it. I'm wondering how much in your um, training, though, yeah. because I also went to school to become a PA and there wasn't this like focus on other chemical. You know, I think this is why for people who've read Joanna Moncrief's work, which I know you have about, you know, the difference between sort of medicalizing a drug and saying like, this is medicine because it's prescribed to you. And then this is a drug because you can get it, you know, in a cigarette or on the street, why that it's so important to understand that they're all drugs, you know? And, and I don't think that was taught to me in school, which is why I missed it even in myself. Like 
I wasn't using the substances at all in a way where I was consciously like, oh, this is going to make me perform or this is going to, I just became addicted to them and physically dependent on them. And so I didn't have a sense of like how they worked or what they were doing to me. I was just using them because I, I had to, and I had a misunderstanding of what they were doing to my physiology. Yeah. And, and I think we, we like to group these um, centrally acting drugs, these, you know, the, these drugs into three categories. It's just like, you know, coffee, nicotine, you know, well, I guess nicotine, if it's not in a cigarette, mostly harmless, you know, no problem, just go for it. It's fine. Culturally yeah. sanctioned yeah. psychiatric medications. Yeah, they're fine as well. Like that's, you know, from a doctor, drugs of abuse, completely different, you know, all of that stuff, absolutely terrible causes dependency, beware. Um, but it's kind of, yeah, sure. There's different risks among the drugs, but really that you could kind of see them in one way, all, all under one category there. And I think the thing that set me off, you know, when I realized actually this coffee and this nicotine is not great. I mean, it was so many factors. And I think a lot of people within the drug harmed community, probably maybe they walked down a similar path. I mean, I wasn't harmed, but I was going through a whole disenchantment with, with the medical establishment just based on the stuff I was reading. And I was just like, well, these psych meds aren't anywhere near as safe as I thought they were. The Xanax really effed me up and that was really bad. I was also starting to look at the treatment of like chronic medical conditions in the U S and how people were just like, Oh, we'll just give you medications rather than getting to the root cause. And all of that, I think questioning of like just establishment things that I'd heard in the past and, you know, coffee, nicotine, it's, it's safe. Like the whole thing came together and I was just like, this probably is like, even though I never hear about these things being that bad, they're probably not good for me. Um, and so everything was kind of crumbling for me as I was learning about the harms with the psych drugs. And I'm just like, I, I kind of want everything out. Mm-hmm. How much do you think though, mainstream psychiatrists or even GPs have this on their radar? Like, Oh, my, you know, younger patient or even middle-aged or whatever age they are using, you know, caffeine and nicotine, I I should look into that maybe as like, maybe that's the underlying issue behind this person's anxiety. Yeah. I don't think they look at it at all, honestly. Like it's, um, what I will say, I think there's a difference between a cup of coffee in the morning and what I was doing, right? Like Mm -hmm. there's a difference between that and like two cups a day and then like a soda and, and then also other stimulants. And so maybe one cup of coffee, it's not going to have that big of an effect. Well, it doesn't because I know pretty much the whole country kind of functions on one cup of coffee and they're not having all these problems. And so, but then there's also people who are more sensitive to it as well. And I know I am more sensitive to it is what I figured out, but I think it should definitely be part of every evaluation. Like how much energy drinks are you using? How much caffeine are you using and all of that? Because if someone's presenting to you with severe, with high anxiety and insomnia, 100% without a doubt, the number one best thing you could possibly do for that person is to make them come off all of those stimulants. It, for me, it ruined my sleep. And could you imagine the effect of like improving someone's sleep if they have like anxiety? It's, it's just enormous. Yeah. 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 So I wonder how you counsel your patients now, since you've had this sort of awakening in your own experience and they come to you and they're in psych med withdrawal, or they're just at the beginning and they want to start reducing their psych meds, but they're using a lot of caffeine and nicotine. It's like a slow process uh, because a, a lot of people come to me, um, so, I mean, some people come to me and they're just like, I'm on board, like, save me. You know, they, they've been hurt and they're on a lot of meds and they're just like, this is really important. I'm going to do it. But I, I also have a lot of people who maybe they've, they're just having their, their, their first run in with like benzos and they've just realized, oh my God, this is bad and they haven't gone through everything. For them, 
they'll say things to me when I say, Hey, we really need to get you off the cigarettes. They'll say, and they'll go, they'll go, why? And I say, well, you know, when you come off stimulants, it's going to lower your anxiety and you're going to be able to tolerate drops better. I say things like it's going to be the difference between your taper lasting one year and three years because it really makes that much of a difference. And they'll say, doc, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Cigarettes reduce my anxiety is what they'll say. Cigarettes, it, th these are the things that I use to, to make myself calm down. And so I end up, and I, I mean, I need to learn how to do this better, honestly, on my own. You know, I, I, I make my case, but it's really difficult because um, it's hard to persuade someone of something logically when they kind of feel it in their body and they just go, they go, no, nah, you know, this, this makes me better. Well, actually, Nicole, let me, let me ask you a little bit, like what... Mm -hmm. What what are your thoughts about that? Like, how do you, I, I don't know if you've also had to kind of persuade people on like, actually these stimulants in general, they, they make you more anxious and they can make this, they mess with your sleep. They can make it harder. How do you, how do you go about that? Yeah. So usually I just tell my story and I mean, like I said, I, I started using caffeine and nicotine when I was young, you know, 15 or something in high school, because it was the cool thing to do. You know, in the 80s and 90s, we used cigarettes. We didn't have vapes back then. So, and then I just became, you know, addicted to them and physically dependent on them. And they, and I kind of just escalated use over time because of that. And it wasn't until I got injured by psychiatric medications and I really sat down and I started studying like the concepts behind benzodiazepine physical dependence, for example. And I learned about interdose withdrawal, like, oh, no wonder I was freaking out so bad and having anxiety and crawling out of my skin. And I was only taking like, you know, two doses of Xanax, like when you understand the half-life of something and how long it gives you therapeutic benefit. And then it makes sense that in between you're going to be having symptoms because your body is, you know, physiologically sort of craving the next dose. When I figured that out, I had this kind of light bulb moment for everything else, for cigarettes, for food, you know, sugar. It all made sense to me then like, oh my, I can't believe that I like went through PA school <laughs> and like, I didn't know this, you know, like, I was similar to the people that you talk to who say, oh, I smoke because it helps my anxiety. I probably there was some denial there. I mean, everybody who's addicted to something lives in some state of denial, right? Because they know it's bad for them, but it, it's uncomfortable to stop. So there was that, like I knew cigarettes were bad, obviously, um, but mostly on the realm of like cancer and like what it would do to your breathing and that kind of thing. I didn't understand what it could and was doing to my mood and my sleep and my level of agitation and my ability to focus. That was not, I can honestly say I didn't understand or know that that was happening. So it was very insidious type thing where I started using these things very innocently as a kid and then it just escalated and was negatively affecting me, but I didn't fully understand why. So once I went through the psych med stuff, uh, I mean, first of all, before, I was, was like, going to say, I, I yeah. want to ask you before we get there, do you think they played any part in you getting on psychiatric medication to begin with? Or do you think that was just going to happen anyway? I'm sure like it, it was an element for sure. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I took them for stress at work. And also, you know, it's like a regular person with normal life things like breakups with boyfriends and that kind of stuff at play. Um, but I think I was way more stressed at work because I was addicted to uh, nicotine and was smoking like crazy. And when you're working and you're seeing patients, it's not like you're out back like smoking in between patients. So I would go long stretches without having nicotine and I would be irritable and agitated and want to smoke, but I couldn't because I was at work, you know? 
Mm-hmm. So certainly that I think played a part. Sure. If I'm looking back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could have gotten on the dip and just sort of snuck one in there. Like, like I used to, you know, oh my God. yeah, <laughs> yeah I never the thought secret, about the that. Secret little, the yeah. secret like bottle in the, yeah. in the white coat somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe if it's I so understood, bad. like I'm saying, the physiology yeah. of like what was happening to me, I would have realized like, oh, I just need to put myself on like a secret, you know, infusion yeah. of nicotine. But I didn't I didn't get it, you know, yeah. and it was the psych med stuff, like really diving in that opened my eyes to the con- the concept of interdose withdrawal. So I'm like, oh, I'm not actually relieving my anxiety by smoking a cigarette. I'm actually squelching out withdrawal from the cigarette that I smoked last. Like, Mm -hmm. holy crap, you know, and the same thing with food. I'm not actually, um, you know, hangry or, or, you know, needing to nourish my body at the moment. I'm eating because I just gave myself a bolus of sugar, uh, you know, a couple hours ago. My insulin comes in and brings my glucose down and I crash and now I'm down here and I crave more sugar because I'm on this roller coaster. And if Mm. I would just even out my blood levels of, you know, sugar intake and make them very low, which I did when I went to ketogenic diet, strangely enough, I was not starving and I wasn't agitated and hangry anymore either. So once I understood this concept of, how drugs affect you and this interdose withdrawal thing, like it all makes sense. And I wasn't driven to get off of caffeine and nicotine from a place of like, um, I mean, I tried to quit like most people do who are smokers when they're, you know, they don't want to be, they want to quit, but I'd give up so easy or be like, Oh, I can't do this because I'm so busy and I'm anxious and, but the the real commitment to that came when I was injured by psych meds because it was such a devastating blow to my health that I finally got the wake up call that like, holy shit, like you're nothing. You have zero if you don't have your health. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I've got to fix this immediately. So talk us, talk, talk me through like, what did you, what was it like for you to, come off caffeine and nicotine in protracted withdrawal? Like how long were you in protracted withdrawal doing those things? What was the process like coming off? Was it hard? And then how did you feel afterwards? Yeah. So the caffeine, I don't remember being that big of an issue. I mean, in in hindsight, um, you know, I probably would have done it a little bit differently. I, I recall having like pretty severe headaches for a while, but Remember when you are like so screwed up in a cold turkey detox from psych meds, like a headache is kind of like, you know, nothing. It it didn't really matter. It didn't affect me that much because I was already so ill that I was like, it was just another symptom in the bucket, basically, you know. Um, But I, I kind of look at all drugs now and I don't know if you share this sentiment, like, I'm not sure that we should be taking people's brain chemistry and just kind of like throwing it up against the wall and like cold turkeying substances. Like I know there's an argument for that for some things like, you know, people who are unable to control their use or whatever. But if you are, I just feel like now knowing what I know and my own experiences, like I'd rather people taper drugs if they can including caffeine and nicotine what do you Mm -hmm. think about that i think i think it's always going to be the gentlest way um and i mean i try and think about it i don't think i've ever heard of someone having a problem like a injury coming off a stimulant so it's so i get less worried about them but from like a physiological perspective i think slowly coming down is just a lot less jarring to to your brain it you know like why have bad headaches like when you when you don't need to like what's the purpose of that if you could just kind of come down slowly mm-hmm. yeah 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 so caffeine wasn't that bad for me it was the the nicotine that was 
the worst. You know, at this point, I was like chain smoking because my psych med withdrawal was so severe. That, that's all I did was like pace around with akathisia and chain smoke cigarettes. Um, but at some point, I kind of had the realization like, all right, I want to know if this is making me worse or if it's holding me back from my recovery in any way. And it took a while. I mean, I was so ill in, in psych med withdrawal that in the beginning, it, it couldn't even been a thing on my radar. Like I was just way too consumed with staying alive and not, you know, harming myself and just minute to minute survival. But once I got like many years into it, I was settled enough where I could sort of add this to the pile, even though I was still incredibly sick. So mm -hmm. um, once I made the decision, I also enlisted some friends in the psych med withdrawal community who were also smokers and who were curious about what they would feel like if they didn't smoke. And so we had like a buddy system. There were like three of us that I can remember um, who all kind of did it at the same time. And we used the same method. So me personally, I used a vape pen um, that I filled up myself. So not one of the preloaded ones that you can get, but the ones that you had like juice and that you put in there. And I ordered uh, from a company that will mix different strengths of nicotine for you um, and whatever concentration you want it. And so I started at a, a huge dose of nicotine. It was 18, 18 milligrams was the liquid. Uh, and I just let myself vape it freely whenever, you know. So I would just sit there and like chain smoke the vape like crazy because I figured, all right, well, cigarettes have what, like 7,000 chemicals in them or something. So just by switching to the vape, I had already lost, you know, 6,999 chemicals mm -hmm. that I was detoxing from. And the only thing I was replacing was nicotine. So the, the two weeks, I would say, after that were really brutal. Like I got sick, you know, diarrhea. I mean, my sleep went totally to shit. All of my benzo withdrawal symptoms kind of flared up and went crazy. And I just like braced through it. Like I just, I was already bed bound and like not at work. And so I had the, um, the luxury, I guess, if you can call it that, I'm just kind of like locking myself in my house and not having to deal with any outside stressors or anything. And I got through that sort of worst detox part of it. And then once I was on the nicotine alone, it became easier to just order these lowering strengths of nicotine. And then, you know, maybe like every two weeks or every month, I would go down a notch and I would vape, you know, 16 milligrams and then 14. And then at the end, I think I got like, you know, even smaller increments until I made it to zero. And then I allowed myself to vape zero for as long as I wanted. You know, some people can make the argument, oh, there's, you know, whatever's in those juice that could be doing terrible things to your lungs, which was like, fine, but I'm not smoking cigarettes. So this is better. And I realized that the vape was a tool. It was a means to an end and it was meant to be temporary. I wasn't always going to vape because also I think it like looks stupid and ridiculous and like walking around in this cloud of whatever. Like it's like a train. It's a choo choo. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I did not want to be like a lifetime vapor yeah. by any means, yeah. you know? So I already consciously knew that I was using it for a, a short period. Mm. And the strangest thing happened. And it didn't just happen to me. It happened to the other two people that I was in the quitting smoking sort of agreement with. All of us forgot we vaped at a point. Like, I just quit looking for it. It was weird. It was like, oh, I, mm -hmm. I didn't vape at all today. You know, after I'd been on zero milligram nicotine for a while. And I think part of it too, the motivation was like, oh, I'm tired of spending money on these stupid juice things and these coils that you have to put in there and like, you know. They get all like burnt and they taste yeah. bad and you have to really yeah. swap them like, out. Oh, I'm so done with this thing, yeah. you know? So, but it just literally happened naturally. Like I didn't have to say, 
you know, it wasn't like a baby's passy or whatever that you have to take it away. It was like, I just, my brain gave it up and that was it. I was done. And now I legit cannot stand the smoke smell. Like, I'm like, I can't believe I used to smell like that. Like, um, and the only thing that happens very rarely is I will randomly get a craving for a cigarette, maybe, you know, once every couple of months, if I'm like sipping a cup of coffee or, you know, something stresses me out really bad, like my brain will go like, oh man, that would feel really good right now. And then I'm just able to be like, yeah. Yeah. You know, I saw, yeah. If, I don't think it goes away. I mean, it, I love the smell of cigarettes, which is really? for me, I think it's like really, well, for me, it's like my grandma smoked, chain smoked her entire life, like into her nineties. And, um, and I, I mean, my dad smoked, I think my mom smoked a ton. It's just like, there's some, I think if you come from these families, have a cigarette users, sometimes there's like a nostalgia about it as well, where, you know, it makes yeah. me think of my grandmother. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, but yeah, I mean, still occasionally we'll get cravings for them as well. I want to mm-hmm. ask you though, Nicole, what, what did you and your, and your, um, other protracted withdrawal friends, what did you notice about your symptoms after coming off the, the nicotine? Like how, how did you feel? Yeah. I mean, obviously I was still in protracted psychiatric drug withdrawal. So it wasn't like I, you know, getting off cigarettes healed me or anything, but it certainly leveled out the amount of anxiety that I had. I think Mm -hmm. my burning skin got better in hindsight because I noticed like every time I would smoke or like give myself a stimulant, even still to this day, if I I've accidentally had a big bolus of caffeine and I get like, you know, it's like my withdrawal kind of like creeps up again to the surface where I feel like I want to crawl out of my skin and I'm so agitated. And I notice like I'm twisting my muscles around and like grinding my teeth. Like, so all of that kind of stuff just came down a notch, essentially, you know, I'm still in withdrawal and I still had tons of withdrawal symptoms, but if we can make withdrawal even a few notches easier for ourselves, like why the hell would we not do that? You know, Mm -hmm. on top of, I didn't want to do like a protracted syndrome and then get out of it and have all these other health problems because I was like a chain smoker. You know, Mm it's like, it didn't make sense to me. Why am I fighting my ass off to heal from this one thing, but I'm doing this other thing that's just creating more health problems. Like I want to be healthy, period. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm fighting so hard because I want my life and I want it to be good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before we hit record, you know, we were talking about how these drugs kind of hijack your brain and make it hard to realize, you know, your level of functioning. I thought, Share your thoughts on that because I thought that was uh, that was really interesting about how you may not realize how you change or even have that insight after kind of years of being on it. Yeah, I mean, I think you can, for anybody who's in the psychiatric drug harm community who's been harmed by a psych drug, like if you look back at your level of functioning, you hear so much from people like, I had no idea how much it was affecting me. But when I look back, I realize how much it was, you know? And so I think it's an insidious process. I think it's slow with nicotine and caffeine. I think you kind of escalate use. You just become used to the new altered version of yourself and you lose touch with your baseline, like who you were before you started taking these substances. So like you can't even remember or get back to that place because your brain is the thing that is altered and it's also the thing that would you would use to know like who you are and what you used to be so i think it all just becomes mixed up and people can't pull out like oh this isn't just me it's an altered version of myself yeah i love yeah that's like really well said um and the corollary between um 
how you can lose yourself with nicotine and caffeine and how people lose themselves after they start an antidepressant or benzo after several years is a really good one. Um, I remember telling myself like a lot of lies. Um, well, I mean, you just don't know. Like when I, my daughter was born, I was irritable. I, it was annoying to read to her, like between work, I would be collapsed on the couch scrolling on my phone and I'm just like, oh, this is just being a dad. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a young dad. It's hard. You know, I think, you know, uh, it's tiring. Um, you know, I can only, I just do my best work in the morning. You start to tell yourself these things and you buy into them. And, and yeah, you know, I just been on that train of kind of heavy stimulant use for like a couple of years at the point when I realized it was really bad for me. And when I came off, it was just like, oh my God, this is like what it feels like to sleep properly. This is what it feels like to actually be able to focus for like long periods of time. This is what it feels like to not have these weird like stimulant food cravings where it's just like you get, you gorge yourself on food because you're like crashing from like coffee and you just need to eat bad food and it, and, and all of that kind of drips off and, and I mean, it's the same thing that I that I see with the the patient, the the poly drugged patients that come to our practice, and that you know they'll start an antidepressant, and then they'll just be in this persistent state of just like you know apathy and low motivation. They feel kind of crummy, and then you know it's been maybe like two, three, four, five years since since they got on, and that's just like what they feel like. And then the doctors are just like, oh, you know, depression, it's, it's so mysterious. It's this chronic persistent illness. Like they're not like looking at it and they're just like, we'll just give you some Abilify now. And then you get on that and then the same thing kind of happens and 10 years creeps by and you are way more disabled than you were before you got on the drugs. And, and, but by, by then you've like so many people don't realize it. They're just like, this is just who I am. Mm -hmm. I, I've got this mysterious illness called depression. Yeah. So some of it is definitely denial and lying to yourself. And some of it, I think, is just like we said, lack of education. Like if people were truly informed both about psychiatric drugs and, and you know, how they work and how they cause withdrawal and this inner dose withdrawal. And if you lower your dose, you can actually get withdrawal. It's not the return of the underlying condition or whatever. It's a, it's withdrawal. You know, if people knew that and the same with cigarettes and caffeine, like if they understood the concepts, I think they could better identify what was going on in their body, but it's not taught and they don't know. And so they mistake it or can make an excuse for it or identify it as something that it's not. Mm -hmm. And it just perpetuates the whole process, you know? I mean, these drugs are changing your brain. Like, yeah, there's like, I think there's in a dose withdrawal and, and that's playing a role. But I just think like being on them is just aside from the fluctuations in your serum of these drugs kind of going up and down and tickling the receptors mm -hmm. after long-term use, I just think they're changing your brain. Like yeah. I think that someone, even if you drink a cup of coffee in the morning, it is, changing your brain in a way that will be impacting your sleep in subtle ways that you're not aware of. Like even if it's 18 hours, you know, from when you last had caffeine and it's completely out of your system long to like, I mean, that was my experience. I, I just, mm -hmm. my sleep changed in such an interesting way afterwards. It's, and so I, I don't think you want these external substances exerting this kind of, force on your brain's physiology and, and, and modifying it. Uh, it's. Yeah. It's Do you good. think the brain kind of like looks for what it needs? I've always wondered that too. Like when I was heavily medicated on benzos and sleeping pills, I drank Coca-Cola in a can like crazy. And I'm like, Oh, well, maybe it was like, you know, like a natural craving for that, for like a stimulant and tons of sugar because I was so sedated from, what I was being prescribed, you know, it's trying to rebalance itself, but yeah, 
And Cole, I'm glad we got on our soapbox and sh- yeah. shared our stories. I don't want to sound this. like a purist yeah. and like I'm shaming people who smoked or like, you know, reformed smokers are the absolute worst. Like, I don't want to judge people, you know, because I was there and I know how hard it is to quit, especially when you're in psychiatric drug withdrawal. Like anything in psychiatric drug withdrawal is so hard, but the payoff, I promise, is worth it if people can get there. Mm -hmm. I'd I'd also like to talk about like some tips because there are some ways, you know, like I, I shared my vaping, um, method. So if anybody wants to use that, but there are people who, um, like one of the co-founders of, um, BIC Benzo Info Coalition, she quit and she quit cold Turkey and she did it by reading, um, two books that she asked me to share with people. Um, the biggest one she said was freedom from nicotine by John Polito and then Alan Carr's easy way to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the people, uh, who, or the freedom from nicotine people, I guess it's whyquit.com is the website. They actually are sort of like a grassroots movement for quitting, um, cold Turkey because they argue that like pharma, screwed up quitting smoking and that quitting quitting cold turkey is the best way and that they kind of like scared doctors into thinking that they have to prescribe these um cessation tools of like you know graduated doses of nicotine which just keeps people locked in longer so i guess there's like even varying you know arguments out there in the quitting nicotine you know communities like versus cold turkey versus tapering me personally i don't think i ever would have quit if i tried cold turkey i had multiple times and failed and the graduated doses is what worked for me but there are people who did that i know in severe benzo withdrawal quit cold turkey and had success as well and then with caffeine like Mm -hmm. it's well you can First of all, get yourself some, you know, water processed decaf or regular decaf and just start use what you know about psych med withdrawal and apply it to it's just a different drug. So start tapering your caffeine, right? Like drink three quarters regular and some decaf and then just keep increasing the amount of decaf that you're having. And then you're mostly off of caffeine. You could do the same thing with diet sodas and then replace that, you know, need for like a bubbly drink with, you know, flavored um, bubble water. I'm like addicted to that stuff now. That's yeah. Yosef and I joke. I, you probably have one. Do you? Here's mine. <laughs> I don't I don't have one on, oh. on hand at the moment. Spindrift. So, yeah. We yeah. should get a sponsorship. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So there's so many tips and tricks and just, you know, ways to get yourself tapered slowly off if you feel like that's the way that is going to, you know, be easiest and most gentle on your brain and physiology. But ultimately, just getting there, I think, will make everybody feel a lot better if they can do it. Yeah. Well said. Um, I have nothing to add to that, really, Nicole. Anything else on, on your side? I think that's it. Just good luck if you're, you know on these substances and you want to get off, um, you know, get a buddy maybe like I did. It's a lot easier when you're like accountable to somebody else. And you also realize someone else is kind of doing it alongside you and you have like, you know, support. So, yeah. 